The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. And we have a, uh, a stellar cast tonight, starting with Stephen Moga, who's a doctoral student here in City Design and Development at MIT, followed by Will Stacy, a young photographer from New York. And wrapping up will be our um, beloved chairman, Larry Vale, who will be reflecting on uh, both the presentations that Will and Steve give, as well as to make some observations of his own about photography and um, city planning and rebuilding New Orleans. I'll introduce each of uh, both uh, Steve and Will um, just before their presentation. Steve is going to go first. Um, Steve has, uh, in talking to both of them, uh, I came to realize that in a way, each of them in his own way has been preparing to photograph New Orleans at this particular point in time for quite a while now. And they didn't know it until they arrived in New Orleans after, after the hurricane. Um, Steve came to us this year as a first year doctoral student following uh, an undergraduate degree in political science from Carleton College in Minnesota and a master's degree in city planning from UCLA. But also, after five years' experience working in low-income African-American communities on affordable housing issues, and then another five years working on issues of historic preservation. And I think that this background will come clear to you as he presents his photographs. Steve. Thank you, Anne. So as Anne mentioned, I'm going to show photos from two recent visits to New Orleans in January and March of this year. I'm a first year PhD student in the CDD group and my interest is in planning history. And prior to MIT I had some experience with photography but usually on the other end of the camera I guess you could say. Um, working with a nonprofit project called the Neighborhoods Project of Los Angeles. So for me taking photos and thinking about um, places, neighborhoods, urban planning is connected. I've been a student of the city of New Orleans and its history for 13 years. And recently, New Orleans has come to the national attention. But few people outside of the city have much non-tourist experience with it. There's many misconceptions about this place. And there's a debate about rebuilding in this context. Rather than establish public safety first, then coordinate return of residents, instead, in the public debates, neighborhoods have been given a test, a test to prove their future viability based on population. Yet these decisions are highly constrained and neighborhood conditions vary tremendously. New Orleans is a city of neighborhoods like the French Quarter, the Lower Ninth, Ferret, Treme, Lakeview, Uptown. And today I'm gonna to talk about two neighborhoods that I visited on these trips. So New Orleans recently, Broadmoor, which is here, Here's the river, Mississippi River. The lake is at the top, north is at the top. The French Quarter is here. The Central Business District is here. This is Broadmoor. And Holy Cross, which is part of the Lower Ninth. In thinking about photographing New Orleans, I asked myself the question, what does New Orleans look like what did it look like before and after the flood? And what are our impressions of the place and what happened there? One of the challenges in photographing New Orleans is that it was physically dilapidated and decayed before the flood. New Orleans has an unfamiliar architecture to most Americans. And it was common to see peeling paint or scruffy landscaping, sagging porches around the neighborhoods of New Orleans. Often on previous visits, I would see vacant lots, abandoned houses, potholes. New Orleans was a city with significant social and economic problems. 
but it had unusual resources too, a strong sense of civic pride, a long tradition of mixed race families, and a well-deserved reputation as a cultural meeting ground, a place of family ties and rootedness, and of particular interest to me, a historic built environment. Today, when you visit New Orleans, the thing that you see is the absence of people in the streets. Some of the other symbols that you might see are blue tarps on roofs from wind damage from the hurricane. But you're unlikely to see the interior destruction in most areas if you don't go inside the homes. You may only see piles of debris at the street side. And everywhere you go, you see signs, signs of civic pride, homemade signs, political signs, signs for demolishing homes, people who will gut the interior of her house for you, people looking for work. So I'm going to talk about two neighborhoods today. The first one is Holy Cross. And Holy Cross is a neighborhood in the lower Ninth Ward, a neighborhood which is probably at least familiar in name to most Americans now. The lower Ninth Ward is downriver from the French Quarter, and it's separated from the rest of the city from the by the Industrial Canal. This is a photo of the Industrial Canal. I was hesitant to go to the Lower Ninth the first time in January because I was unsure of what I would see, but I knew it would be difficult. And when I got there, it was a kind of visual overload, trying to take everything in at once. The flooding in the Lower Ninth Ward was caused by a catastrophic break in the Industrial Canal. And a wall of water washed over the neighborhood, <laughs> lifting houses off of their foundations. When I visited in January, there were scenes of devastation like this one all around on every side. And it was the scale that impressed me more than anything else. I returned in March and I had different ideas in mind, but again, I was unsure of what I would see. One of the things I had in mind is that March is Shotgun House in New Orleans, a long tradition of the Preservation Resource Center. And I heard that a tour was going to be offered in the Holy Cross neighborhood, part of the Lower Ninth Ward. So I decided to go. Holy Cross is part of the Lower Ninth, but it's on the <clears throat> river side. And it's part of the story of what's happening in the Lower Ninth Ward. Before I visited there, I had heard that houses were wiped out in Hurricane Betsy, that the area should not be rebuilt. And I knew that a political conflict was underway about demolition and clearing of the houses there. I had witnessed the scenes of utter devastation in other parts of the Lower Ninth Ward. And then I learned that Holy Cross was a historic district. I wondered how could a place destroyed by flooding in 1965 be in a historic district? And why did people tend to talk about poor black historic neighborhoods one way and middle class and white wealthy historic neighborhoods using another language? How could a place with houses older than the Industrial Canal be slated for complete demolition? Instead of look and leave, a slogan used by the military to keep people out, this tour was called Look and Believe. This is Gina Jones. I talked to Gina in Holy Cross. City services have not been reestablished there. The city has stated that the area is not safe. And many of the people who live there or who did live there only return infrequently. Gina doesn't live in this house. It's her friends who live there. And she agreed to talk to visitors who wanted to learn more about Holy Cross. While I was talking to her, another couple talked to her and said that they lived in Uptown and they wanted to know how much water did these houses get here. All around the city you hear people ask, how much water did you get? How long did it sit? How much damage was there? Three to five feet, but it receded, Gina explained. What's the elevation, they wanted to know. We're on high ground here, she said. It's near the river. It was the break in the Industrial Canal that brought the water. 
Oh, they said, we're only five feet above sea level in Uptown. In this contested environment, rehabilitation work is underway. What, I wonder, determines whether people think a place is safe from flooding or not. This is Kevin Mercadell. He works for the National Trust. He previously worked in affordable housing in Harlem and in the South Bronx. I talked to Kevin about this house and about the project that he's involved in. He's coordinating this effort called Home Again in the Holy Cross neighborhood. Here was the kind of preservationist that I wanted to talk to. Afterward, I wondered what assumptions are being made about these neighborhoods. In this same way, I wanted to go to Broadmoor, a different place on the other side of town. Broadmoor is known as the bottom of the bowl. Some of you may have heard this expression that New Orleans is shaped like a bowl with water on all sides. So if New Orleans is a bowl, Broadmoor is the bottom of it, the low point. Broadmoor is a place that the Bring New Orleans Back Commission has discussed as being one that should be converted to green space. What I wondered was happening in this place, a mid-city neighborhood on the other side of town of mixed race and mixed income. What I found was a place that has a strong sense of community, a cohesive built environment, a mix of historic housing styles, Spanish colonial revival and other styles of the 1920s, and a strong neighborhood organization. Broadmoor residents decided to fight. They did not want to lose their homes. They do not want to lose their neighborhood, and they don't want to see it marked off the map. So they got visible, and clearly walking around the neighborhood, I noticed that part of their strategy is to make their neighborhood visible to anyone who comes near. Everywhere I went, I saw signs like this one, in the neutral ground, in front lawns, at intersections. The day before I left on this most recent trip in March, the Times-Picayune, which is the local new newspaper, ran a front page story with a map showing flood claims over the past years, and Broadmoor has had a lot of them. But the map had a caveat, it had a footnote. It said only homes that are insured are shown on this map. And as some of you know, in many areas, people are not insured, and so the map did not account for this. The map did also not account for infrastructure requirements and improvements. And the author explained that there was a big spike in flood claims in Broadmoor in the 90s, but then a decline in recent years after a infrastructure improvement. And I began to realize that often, looking at these places, there are problems in interpreting data. The data do not clearly suggest one course of action or another. And one of the things that became clear about Broadmoor was that everywhere there is risk. Everyone in New Orleans lives with risk. Pumps are everywhere. The city is interconnected. And water flows to the lowest point. And I also wondered, and reading this article, it raised the question, should flood maps assume that levees might break? And should an 80-year-old neighborhood like Broadmoor be abandoned? In my photography, I've asked a series of questions. What is happening in this place? What is the rhetoric about the condition and the future possibilities? And what is happening on the ground? For me, this is an interactive pursuit. And often when I take photographs, I don't have specific images in mind, like a photojournalist might. For me, photography is a kind of field work, and it's personal. And I thought about what I was trying to do with the camera before giving this talk, and I decided there are at least three things that I do when I think about photography. One is that taking photographs is a way to go places. It's a mode of engagement that's slower, it's directed, and it's on foot. Second. 
I use the camera to look for indicators, signs and symbols, and I use it as a way to read the built environment. And third, I'm using the camera to ask questions. Why does something look a certain way? What's happening in this place? Even in its current state, the uniqueness of New Orleans impresses strongly. New Orleans is a city of distinct neighborhoods with a close-knit historic built fabric. There's a highly uncertain political environment, and we know that stories of the place shape what we think is possible and what the future possibilities are. But New Orleans still waits. Many efforts like the one I saw underway in Holy, in Holy Cross and in Broadmoor are ongoing. But having visited there in January and March, you can't escape the feeling that disaster persists all around. It's with you all the time in the marks of the emergency crews, the reckoning after the disaster, X's on the houses, surveying the city, and at a time when nothing else works, communicating by spray paint. Thank you. I neglected to say when I introduced Steve Moga that he has a website on which the images that he showed, plus many, many, many others, are up online. And that's at mogaphoto.com, uh, which you see up there on the whiteboard. Will Stacy, our next speaker, also has uh, a website. And you can see the images he'll be showing and many, many more on that website, willstacy.com. So you may not all be able to see it from where you're sitting, but if you want to come up later, I just wrote the web uh, sites up on the whiteboard. Will Stacy is a young photographer who's living in New York. Um, he grew up in Philadelphia. He uh, has only graduated from NYU in photography uh, in the Tisch School a few years ago, and yet his images have already been published. He's becoming better and better known as a young photographer. Um, he said to me when I invited him to be uh, part of this, uh, this lecture, um, actually the two of these, uh, these photographers were the inspiration for this, particular, uh, for this particular topic tonight, as well as uh, Larry Vale's interest and MIT's interest in general in the rebuilding of, of New Orleans. Uh, but Will said to me, you know, it's as if I've been doing batting practice when I arrived in New Orleans, it's as if I'd been doing batting practice for this assignment. Will, um, as, uh, to, to put, his, put himself through, through college, worked as a union laborer on construction and demolition jobs uh, in summers in college, and then he went back and photographed on these construction sites with an access that having been a union laborer, laborer himself gave him. He then, for his thesis uh, in, uh, at Tisch, did uh, a study of murals in low-income neighborhoods in Philadelphia, minority neighborhoods, uh, working with the Philadelphia Mural Project, a nonprofit organization. And his photographs uh, uh, not only are wonderful photographs, they're being used by that organization today. Uh, and then embarking uh, after graduation on travels, he went and began a series of photographs of, of, of deindustrialization uh, in towns uh, around the country. And also, before Katrina, had started photographing after hurricanes along the Gulf Coast. So welcome to MIT, Will. I hope this won't be your last time. And voila. Thank you.
Um, I want to give you guys a quick introduction to my work. Um, and uh, like Ann said, um, my past projects have helped me prepare for the work that I did in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Oh, okay. You can lift the microphone just higher on your shirt. Is this better? Is this better? <laughs> um, in a two year long project on construction, I recorded my experiences as a union laborer. Um, and working with the mural arts program in Philadelphia, um, I was able to understand how photography can be used to not only document the efforts and achievements of a group, but also provide a gateway to envision the future, uh, which is something that will be very important in the work that I'm doing in New Orleans. Um, in 2004, a series of four hur hurricanes tore through Alabama and Florida, um, and this is what began uh, my project after the cry, um, in which I uh, am exploring the impact hurricanes have on communities. Um, and then this is one of the images from my project called The Ruins Investigating the Deindustrialization of America. I arrived in New Orleans six weeks after the storm um, and immediately realized that all of my previous work I was continuing here. Um, I found myself exploring and, and continuing on many familiar ideas and themes. The destruction was absolutely unbelievable. Um, and when I was there in October, it was, it was really a ghost town. Um, the only traces of life um, were the things left behind. Um, and, and amidst this absence, um, I began to explore the evidence of people's life before the storm. As I wandered through the city, photographing people's neighborhoods, homes, businesses, schools, um, and their personal belongings, I felt accompanied by their presence, their spirit. Um, and this, this spirit, this presence, was something that was very important to me in this project, and ultimately is what I felt guided me to my subjects um, and led me to what I photographed. Um, one of the few people that I did encounter um, was Esther Blackman. Um, and the following photographs were taken on Mrs. Blackman's first visit um, to her home after the storm. Um, she was there to recover what she could and, and to really just, just take, this, take it all in. Um, she had to stop at times to cry and for the most part she seemed really shaken, tired and withdrawn. Um, as she stared off into thought, pondering the future, um, I saw in her eyes that, that she knew there was more to come um, and that the battle had only just begun. And this is a photograph of her daughter. Um, she's a strong woman, and uh, I, I think she's going to be prepared for the long road ahead in, in dealing with the recovery and rebuilding her life.
when I returned to, home to New York um, and began working with the series, these series of images, um, I began contacting Katrina survivors and, and collecting their stories. Um, and these, these stories that people were sharing with me were so powerful um, that I ultimately was, ultimately was moved to shift my focus um, and start investigating these, these people and their stories. Um, and as I continue my work, I plan to create a narrative by combining my images and their writing. Um, the stories, memories, reflections that I've collected describe these unbelievable stories of escape, survival, um, their reflections on how life has changed after the storm, and where they're, they're, what they're doing now, and how they're rebuilding their lives. Um, and, and I see these voices, these stories, um, as they stand next to my images, as a way to, to carry my viewer, guide my viewer through this place, through my photographs, just as these people's presence guided me um, as I explored this place. Um, and I want to share a story with you um, that Renee Lewis has uh, shared with me. We have yet to get a femur trailer. We have been evicted from the hotel that we were in in Florida. The contractor that we hired to fix my mother's house has stolen the few items that we were able to salvage, which has totally crushed her. We are fighting daily battles with our insurance company, mortgage company, FEMA, etc., which has me in a complete mental wreck. We have not yet received any insurance money to fix our property is seven months after the storm, for God's sakes. Nothing seems to be getting better. In fact, it seems to, to be getting increasingly worse. Stress is killing us all. We lost my dad right after the hurricane. He had a heart attack and dropped dead. He never had heart problems in his life. We had to have a mock funeral because there was nowhere to bury him. He was cremated. Stress is killing us all. While I know that there are a lot of people with different stories, everyone is going through their own personal hell. I don't think that anyone who has not actually been here, seen it, smelled it, or lived it could understand. <clears throat> Photographing what remains of the past has allowed me to understand the present um, and as the storm has left its mark, changed lives, um, I'm interested in what changes will take place in the future. Um, as I continue to work in New Orleans, I want to document these moments of change. Um, I am in the midst of planning to work with a community group um, and document its efforts in shaping the future of New Orleans um, it's planning, it's rebuilding. And working with that group, I want to explore the individual stories um, that exist within a larger context of a group effort. Um, these, these individuals' efforts must be seen and heard. Um, and I'm not just interested in my photographs as a document. Um, I see them as a contribution to, to the rebuilding of New Orleans as, as a tool for envisioning the future of the city uh, by recording the visible, tangible marks of change, such as, as the progression of, of the efforts that individuals are making, the, the marks that, that can be seen from, from man's doings. Um, and, and working in areas and rebuilding them. Um, I will be documenting this, but on 
at the same time, they will be revealing um, the invisible, the, the things that you, that you can't see, such as the, the energy, the dedication and spirit and beauty of, of these efforts and these people that exist in the everyday and the ordinary. Um, this, I don't know if you can, you can hear it in my voice, but I'm more passionate and consumed by this project than, than any other work I've done to date. Um, I, I know I must return, and I don't know how long I'm going to be working on this project, um, but it's, these stories and experiences must be heard, and it's, I'm connected to this work and this project in, in so many ways. Um, <clears throat> I'm convinced that there's a contribution to be made through photography in the rebuilding and planning of the future of the city. Um, and I'm looking for ways to do so. I'm determined to seek a dialogue in, in helping to rebuild New Orleans. Um, I just wanted to close with these series of images as we think about the future. Can you guys read that? Ideas and leadership will shape our future. We will prosper or decline based on who we choose to lead. And then a uh, list of politicians. These moments of, of transition um, really must be, be preserved and understood as they are our gateway into the future. Any better? I don't know if it's doing, yeah, that sounds better. Um, anyway, I, I had the, the pleasure to spend an afternoon with Steve Moga photographing uh, at the end of March uh, in the New Orleans East neighborhood. And I think, as you can see here, uh, how important it is, literally and figuratively, to have people 
like Steve and Will, uh, go see what's on the other side of the tracks um, and to uh, show us in the, I think, great tradition of photography going back at least to Jacob Rees, uh, something about how other people are living at a time of great distress. Um, this is actually looking at a pumping station outfall uh, in New Orleans East that was there. But one of the things that, that Anne asked me to do uh, in a simple email was step back and reflect on the potential of potential role of photography in rebuilding New Orleans and more generally in planning. Uh, um, uh, and uh, so what I wanted to try and do is uh, assess a little bit about the, the feeling that I have from the work that the others have shown tonight, but to also try and convey through some of the the images that um, uh, that I took uh, a few days ago, some of the principles that I think may underline not only uh, what their photographs show, but but what I was trying to do as well. Um, but more, if I'm to take that charge of being a, a bit more reflective, it came into full focus on Friday morning when I was on a panel with Governor Blanco in New York. And she said in introducing her remarks, um, uh, the following. She described New Orleans as the first American city to be erased and forced to redesign itself. And I think, first of all, she got the verb wrong. Uh, it was not erased, as you have clearly seen tonight. And second, she had the protagonist wrong. Cities are not capable of designing or redesigning themselves. It's about people it's about communities, it's about interpretation, it's about the role of designers and, and community groups uh, and the role of artists and others uh, who are going to shape that kind of uh, material. And I, I can't tell you how many times I heard people refer to this city as a blank slate. Someone else on the same panel uh, that was with me who should know better, uh, who's visited the place, uh, is describing these kinds of places. Um, so the first thing that's very clear to me is that the role of photography in New Orleans and more generally in planning has to be to bear witness and to remind people that most neighborhoods have not been erased by the storm. Um, they've been merely rendered more vulnerable to subsequent human action. Um, the legacy of the modernist tabula rasa is still with us in this kind of uh, thinking, the arrogance of mid-century planning and design these kinds of things are very, very clear. But what photography is doing is both interpreting and documenting cultural landscapes. It's forcing planners and other citizens to come to grips with the deepest human dimensions of inhabited places. Uh, even if they're destroyed and abandoned, they're inhabited in very fundamental ways. Uh, their rights and responsibilities that we can see still visible in the piles of recombinant debris that we've seen tonight. Um, their property lines, their family ties, their local businesses, their remnants of human lives that have been upended but may nonetheless end up reconstituted. And this is the kind of message that I think we have to be able to, uh, to look at uh, as, we, as we see some of these things. Uh, so one of the challenges that I think came across in the work that we've seen tonight was, was how does the photographer managed to convey the intimacy of these scenes without violating privacy. Uh, and for me, uh, the relief I had uh, when I first looked at Will's website uh, was the kind of pairing of the dialogue with people uh, with the images. Um, I still find that the image of Mrs. Blackman's first visit, where she's hanging on her defoliated tree, uh, to be a way of legitimizing the role of photography by the conversation that is happening. Sometimes that's a conversation that is literally uh, words exchanged between person and person, human and human. Sometimes it's a, it's a more metaphoric dialogue that the camera is asking the viewer uh, to do. Um, but it's a kind of storytelling that, that provides a right of entry into a disrupted world uh, that I think gives the moral credibility uh, to this kind of work uh, and makes it seem less intrusive than it might. Um, the thing that I find uh, so remarkable about the photographs uh, that we've seen from Steve and from Will 
uh, and from others in this area, is the way, the extent to which the utterly conventional in cities is made extraordinary by the forced deviation from normalcy. Uh, there's this rearrangement of the everyday that we see as we look through New Orleans and places. It's familiarity, but there are key pieces missing. Uh, there, that we share as viewers uh, a sense of the, the vocabulary of the complete thing uh, so that we can see the absences, we can know the extent of the missing gap that's there. We know what's been made crooked, uh, whether it's the one-way sign that, that we saw in one of Steve's photos or, or something else. Um, these are photos about control and loss of control. Um, there are these partial inversions of convention that just permeate the, the kind of process of photography post-disaster, especially in New Orleans. Uh, there are violations of boundaries all over the place. It's indoor and outdoor. How are those transformed from what we conventionally think of? You know, what does it mean when the house doesn't have a window, when the door is open? Uh, public and private, uh, it's transformed, past and present, horizontal and vertical, things that we take for granted as pedestrians, uh, strength and weakness, permanent, ephemeral, abandonment and return, despair and faith. So as I was trying to make some sense of this, I, um, I wanted to look at three kinds of ways that I think photography may, may speak to us. Um, uh, the first is literally. Uh, there is a process of denotation. There's a sense that uh, sometimes the words in the image, neighbors, let me gut your house, Katrina sucks, walkers were here, 914.05. Um, these kinds of things that, that, that are there, in this case in, the, in New Orleans East. Um, or here in Plaquemine Parish, uh, where I spent an afternoon with Lee Graham, um, it says, God will, will give back more uh, on the slide. Uh, these kinds of messages that people are making out there for others to come by. Katrina was big, but God is bigger. Uh, here we're in Mississippi, uh, where most of my images that will follow are from. Uh, this is the, the town where, of Waveland. Uh, if ever there was a place more aptly named for the uh, juxtaposition of, of sea and land that occurred when the center of the hurricane passed through seven months exactly before this, this photograph was taken, uh, it would be Waveland, Mississippi, um, or Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, uh, where the sign ironically says, do not remove steeple. Um, who, who are they talking to? Presumably, it's, it's simply those who would uh, clean up the debris and not recognize uh, what this is. Um, but it's a piece of a missing juxtaposed puzzle uh, that is just simply uh, in the wrong place. Some people in Mississippi seem to have managed a bit of humor uh, by time. Uh, uh, here we are a block away from, from the, the Gulf of Mexico in a neighborhood that was completely wiped to the, the floor slab by the force of the storm surge uh, in a place that had existed for many decades without ever having a, de a direct hit from a hurricane. Um, and uh, uh, another one, uh, who'd a thunk, just another manic Monday, and then the name of the family uh, that was there. Uh, these messages that are out there, the literal way that's there. But photography is doing something, uh, I think, even more powerful and more intrinsic with the aesthetics of the metaphor. And it's something that we saw, I think, in a lot of the work of the first two. And that's taking taking things that are normally uh, properties of the photograph and emphasizing them. Uh, in, in one case, uh, what, what might be called exemplification, drawing attention to certain things more than others. So the symmetry of places, uh, like the, like the sand-covered path uh, leading up to this, this church that now exists as a temporary building that is, of course, the first and really only thing to come back uh, here in Waveland, uh, Mississippi or the power of the symmetry of the entryway that seems to have survived completely intact even though the house behind it is nowhere to be seen. Um, this kind of thing where we read in the conventions uh, of aesthetics 
uh, to see everything there except the missing central piece beyond the fountain, which must have been some large house and not an electrical truck or a, a trailer or a student car uh, in the back. These kinds of, of patterns of, of symmetry that were there. Or things that we associate with the pattern of houses that belong on lots centered on their lots. There's a convention there of, of, of houses. And when something is just a kilter, uh, like this one, where the middle house uh, here in uh, New Orleans East um, is simply not where it's supposed to be, uh, it becomes a way of, of understanding the disruption. Or if we looked at that same church in Bay St. Louis, uh, Mississippi, um, here, it's emphasizing the fact that the piece is horizontal instead of vertical on the church, uh, this thing that looks even too large to have ever fit on the top uh, of that, uh, that building. Uh, may have been that was some part of the problem. Um, uh, um, or uh, this kind of unintentionally ironic sign of open house. Uh, or the, the, the fact that it becomes impossible for me to look at azaleas blooming again in quite the same way uh, when I see the foundation plantings and a piece of the foundation and no house uh, that's there, that, that somehow the plantings uh, were, were more uh, able to withstand the power of the storm surge uh, than the entire house that would have been behind it. Um, you know, what was this open house that was planned for seven months and one day before? Uh, who knows? Um, or images um, like this, uh, where you have the recombinant remnants of a barber shop in New Orleans East, inside versus outside, uh, signage that doesn't quite communicate, uh, the kinds of things that, uh, that are drawing attention to uh, a, a symmetrical building um, but no longer really part of the, uh, the place because the chairs and everything else are, are simply piled. Uh, when Steve and I visited this, this area, a little strip mall in New Orleans East, uh, it was as if no one had touched a thing in seven months. Uh, it, it, it really was quite remarkable. All of the recombinant debris of each business just laid out there in juxtaposition uh, in the sand, in the sun, in the dirt, uh, waiting. Um, Delicious takeouts, uh, all that they had to take out from this place uh, looked less delicious by the time um, here uh, in, a, in a place near the central business district of New Orleans. Um, and then in addition to these kinds of, uh, of blown symmetries and, and aesthetic conventions that are upended by photographs of disaster, and in addition to the, the other mode of um, denotation and literal kinds of images, there's a third way that I think these photographs speak to us, and it, it really has to do with kinds of metaphors that we bring to it. Um, another image uh, here, again, from, um, from New Orleans East, uh, where one sees these kinds of messages uh, of rearranged faith and patriotism. Uh, I'm not sure whether Protection One, uh, as the sign says, refers to the flag or or the Madonna, or who, whoever. I'm not too good on my Catholic imagery. But the, the, uh, the, the message uh, of, of, of people trying to assert themselves after the hurricane, commenting on uh, the, the nature of their, their house, uh, even as the water line still remains uh, between the cross and the flag, um, those sorts of things. Or the other view outward from that church uh, in Waveland that, that's there on the temporary thing, where you're left with just the last little bits of brick um, and the figures staring out at the, uh, at the ocean uh, that didn't stop. And then there are chairs that are lined up not like the ones we just saw in, in Will's photograph uh, that still had their debris there from the meeting that preceded the hurricane, they're the chairs that are lined up around a table from people that have come back to their floor slab, uh, that are trying to engage with the new post-Katrina life uh, a block away from, from the Gulf of Mexico that had engulfed uh, their home, uh, but not completely stopped uh, everything else that they cared about. 
the flag on the slab um, is a metaphor uh, for the kind of faith and patriotism uh, that is there in the kinds of parts of small town Mississippi that, that I was going to uh, on that day. And then lastly, um, an image that um, I think again uh, stood out to me in particular. This is a, a house in, in New Orleans East uh, where a high school diploma uh, has been stuffed inside the grating of an abandoned home. And what it says to me is, first of all, someone knows the person who lived in this place. Someone is back wondering about them, trying to be helpful, trying to be involved uh, uh, in the way that they can. Um, and what it seems to me implied in, in photographing this uh, is that there is an invitation to dialogue. There's an invitation to tell the story uh, and imagine the story that might be there even if you can't find Mrs. Blackman and you can't find the people that are there in that place uh, that you'd want to, to work with. And so that to me is the value of, of photography uh, in these kinds of, of settings. Uh, there are correctives to, to false uh, generalizations that demean the nature of an inhabited place, and there are invitations to dialogue, to ask better questions, uh, and to see what can be done to help other people provide better answers. Thank you. out on this exciting response. How's that? No? How's that? Yes? No? <laughs> okay. Um, it, was hard, it was really hard to ch choose what images to show tonight. You know, I knew I had about 20 minutes, so I picked um, specific things to show. So um, that's part of the answer to your question. Uh, Sort of like Larry was saying, there's this inversion. Some things are normal and some things are not. So even in the quarter in Uptown, you'll see blue tarps on roofs. You'll see the effects of 300,000 people missing. You know, you take 300,000 people away from a city and there's, you know, problems in labor supply. There's problems getting people to, you know, just have the basic services of the city working. So the kinds of pictures I took in the quarter were uh, limited restaurant hours, uh, help wanted signs, um, you see more men with guns than you would have before, I think less so than six months ago, but you still see a lot of private security services. I saw guys with state farm shirts on, you know, it's stuff that you wouldn't, or you notice it different, it changes your perception. So even in the areas that we hear about as sort of returning to normal, um, 
nothing is normal. Everything's changed. Um, well, I, I think we're there at, at different times. When I was there, it was an incredible. It was an incredibly surreal experience, in the sense that most areas were completely deserted. The, when I was there, the Lower Ninth Ward was uh, guarded by, um, I guess, the National Guard had come in and, and wasn't allowing people in. Um, but that was really it. Here and there, you would you would come across someone who had, was returning to their home. Um, and even the places that didn't look so devastated were still abandoned when I was there. Um, I assume that they turned over time. I haven't been back since October. Um, I was well, I had some random thoughts and a couple of comments. Um, the, only, the only other flood is Larry knows that I know that they blocked that to say John's kind of flood of And I did a huge map reading on it, and uh, they, they call it in the book and everything. And one of the interesting things about that experience, which totally destroyed a city of about 60,000 people, um, was what happened afterwards. And, um, I, just wonder what the difference is. But actually, what they did was they began to clear away the debris, and then they went around and <coughs> celebrated each flood survived the building. In the city, this is thousands, even though the city was destroyed, there were still thousand buildings or something. And if you go there today, they have this incredible plaque from 1889 that this building survived the flood. If you imagine what buildings would be a disaster. I think no worse than this, because the water was 35 to 40 feet high. And um, I, I, having not been to New Orleans, I'm sort of puzzled by the uh, melancholy of it all. Is it just the scale, or have we, do you think we've lost something about the ability to go back and rebuild, about the desire to do this? It just seems to be an incredible photograph. It was calmly about this whole thing. Is it worth it? Uh, uh, or, 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 or not. And um, another comment that I have is it seems almost, I, I, photographs are beautiful, really, so don't take it in your It seems almost too easy to be photographing the destruction. <laughs> because I think everywhere I put my camera, I'm going to get a good photograph, right? Or I'm going to get a pathetic photograph, not, not as beautiful as the ones you have. Um, is there a way of recording, and some of your photographs did, I think, latter to be survival. The rebirth, the celebration of, you know, kind of the return of, of, of life. It's a way of some of your photographs did, but I thought you might, might want to comment that. It seems more difficult to get through or get at kind of these days. So just a little disconnected thoughts, but I'm, I'm just wondering. You know, uh, the, <clears throat> well, I was there in October, so I mean, obviously there was. It was, it was very desolate, but uh, it's as I return, it's it's this time, these moments of the in between, of this these transitional moments as the the end of 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 the past, the this old city, its spirit kind of fades out, and the birth of the new begins. It's it's the the handoff. It's the mo these. This moment and, and where we are right now is incredibly important to me um, and, and my work and things that, uh, that I want to investigate. Um, the, and ultimately, it's what I have I mean, as a long, ongoing project. What I feel I have now is kind of chapter one after the storm. Um, and it's where I'm going and where where the city goes, how, what, what happens, um, is, will be told, um, and it's, you know, we'll see. But it's, it's something that is amidst change. Um, I, yeah, I have a lot, <laughs> a lot of things. Um, 
I would say about that. I think there is an aspect to which it is easy, but I think that there's also the dilemma that Larry described in terms of uh, what's inside is now outside and what's outside is now inside. And so um, there's a lot of um, stuff around to photograph, but there's a constant question in, your, in my mind, is this the right thing to be photographing? What story does this tell? What, why am I doing this? You know, are these scenes of devastation a call to action, like I would like them to be, or are they a call to inaction, as you suggested? That would be the opposite meaning, you know? And this is the problem with imagery, I think, and with um, captioning, talking about photographs, um, trying to put something on the web, uh, the way photojournalists tell their story, you know, in the newspaper. So um, there's lots of efforts to tell a story there. You know, if you look in the pages of the Times-Picayune, or if you read any major national paper, they're reporting on things that are happening in New Orleans all the time. And there are efforts to shape the impressions of Americans about what should be done there. Um, it's impossible to tell all of those stories in you know, one short um, presentation or even in one newspaper article. Um, but I think I feel at least a, a responsibility to my own sense of what I've observed. And to me, it's shocking and it's shameful that our country has not done more for a great American city. And um, that's the message. If I you know, had a message to deliver, that's the message that I would, that I would say. is relatively easy to photograph. I think one of the interesting things about being there regularly is that you cease to see it. You know, after a while, like I'm there a lot, and you get very used. I mean, you every time that you go into the lower ninth, you say, oh, it looks like this. But if you drive down Claiborne Avenue, and the same places are still closed up and burned out from the storm, you sort of stop to notice. You stop noticing that because you're going by, back and forth by them every day. Um, I think the idea of the melancholy comes from this, there's this total fear down there of complete disinvestment and abandonment, and it's a really, it feels really isolated down there in terms of once you get down on the ground, this is not a wealthy city, this is not a wealthy state, who's going to help us, we're doing our best to save ourselves, but we need assistance, and it, there's a real risk that we're not going to get it. Um, and the third thing about the survival, I think Larry and I saw a whole bunch of houses that had um, were a complete wreck in Blackman's Parish, but all the families had been back, and so they were saying, um, "Don't just don't bulldoze. I'm keeping." And so there was like this real sort of sense of life attached to these houses, even though you couldn't see the people attached to them. All of the houses had these messages, and it was almost like they were sort of communicating with you. So it just you felt sort of like life was going on, even though you weren't quite sure what was going to happen to the actual structures. I have a, a half-baked thought, so forgive me if it, it seems a little disconnected, but it, it begins with two images that I think that will show. And the images were um, the bent open doors that you showed at the end, looking out into a, a bright, undistinguishable area. And there was one that was in a, in a room that looked as though it was filled with sand and the water had rushed back out the window taking some of the sand back out with it. Is that, am I right that was one of yours from? Um, and, and it struck me that those two slides um, struck me um, to be of a type of photo that we haven't seen. And that started me categorizing the photos that we've seen both in the newspaper and what we saw this evening. And, and, and let me give it a try. We saw photographs and, and TV images of the storm coming in. And in your photos, we see a little bit of evidence of that, but of course we don't see what that was like really. We see trucks up on ends and, and cars, and you can sort of imagine that. Um, then we saw images of uh, floodwaters filling streets, evacuations happening, people congregating on bridges. That was another type of image that we saw. What we didn't see in the media 
but what we saw tonight were pictures of uh, what happened when the water receded, which was another type of action in the environment, so to speak. And then I would take one of Larry's pictures. You, you had the barbershop picture? All right. And the barbershop picture is very interesting because that's, that is an example of what happened when people came back and removed things from the buildings, which is sort of the next step after the water had removed things from the buildings. So there's another type of image, which, and, and the, the, the steeple is a little bit like that for me. Right? I, I can't imagine that the steeple fell in that place. There was the hands of someone who moved it to that position for some reason, to get it out of the street, to right, okay, right. Um, um, and then there's another category, which is another way, which is the wave of things moving back. Sort of exemplified for me by the table that was set up with the chairs around it on the, on the flat sex lab, but, but you all showed um, um, uh, images that might fall into that category as well. And, and it struck me that, that bringing those um, types of damage, other types of damage, removal types of damage, and those types of responses to the, to the public is really the role that the three of you and others have to play. Because the images that most of us have seen are in the first two categories. Right. It's not a question, it's just a, it's just a response to what I think I saw in time of you is document process. Process. Which you wouldn't well, get I don't think I'm quite saying that, saying that, but I haven't thought about it carefully enough to, to, to name it. But there's another part of the story that struck me when I was down there. We were down there on the same day and didn't know that we were actually in the ninth ward on the same day. But the, I was with the Army Corps and they were about various things that have happened. And the thing that isn't visible now, but I'm wondering if a year or two from now, we saw all those beautiful openings along the streets. Supposedly, very few of those may be surviving because they came along to scoop up the debris, and those live oaks have very, very shallow roots. And so they probably have damaged a lot of those live oak trees. Some, you know, we saw some of just these huge trees that were just part of that storm. So this is a case of after damage, by cleaning up the reed, they are getting damaged in that. And then the thing with one of our, I don't think Earthia is here, but the looking at the toxic substance there, is which of these neighborhoods, if you go back in two years, are going to be starting can be starting to suffer from some of the toxic materials that are around. And the one person I met, one of the many people I met, uh, said that she doesn't want to let the dog out in the backyard because she's afraid that the dog will pick up toxic materials and lick paws and so on. So there are these hidden things that it's very difficult to pick up from <coughs> photography. Well, I think the important thing um, that both of you talked about was that you're photographing processes. You're not photographing a condition only at one moment in time. They both, they both have said that they feel this commitment to go back over time to get, to get connected somehow with people who are engaged together in the rebuilding, and, and as Will said, it's chapter one. Uh, as Steve said, he's already been back uh, once. Will is making plans to go back again and to get engaged with, with people and communities who are working, and it seems to me that that's what goes beyond photojournalism, which may be the photographer may be going in and has an assignment and a shooting script, and goes in and takes that photograph that runs to the store. Um, there's, a, there's an investigation. Do you want to comment on that? I think it's also, we both talked that it's, this is something that is taking over us. 
it's something that we are attached to and is, and is in our hearts um, and ultimately has, is, is in our everything. Um, and um, this, is, this is a huge, <coughs> long story that, you know, I don't think America really understands for the most part as a result of the media of what's really happening. The, the stories that I've been collecting um, and talking to, to people of, of what their daily lives are right now, America really kind of has, has no clue of, of, of what the hardships and what conditions exist. Uh, when I was there, you know, you talk about the, the damage that's you know, the, in the ground and whatnot. I, <clears throat> in a neighborhood in St. Bernard Parish, which is, Parish, which is near Murphy Oil, um, I spoke to a woman who said the oil was up to the windows and the water was up to the roofs. Um, and it's, they don't, you know, they don't know if anyone in that neighborhood will turn uh, because of the oil damage in, in the areas, in the ground. Um, but it's, this is something that isn't, you know, just kind of, we did and, and are moving on to the next. It's something that we've begun and the ordinance of, of continuing. Yeah, I uh, have a question more about how this affected you personally as a photographer looking at such incredible images. And, you know, there, a lot of them, to me, are really searing. Uh, just looking at them, I was just wondering how it sort of affects, affects you in your day to day life uh, carrying this material in your head. Well, when I got back, uh, when I got back from, from the ones and uh, I was I was kind of messed up for a month. Um, I was completely withdrawn. I was it, it really took me a while to get back and readjusted to normal life. Buildings that were intact, people on the you know New York is obviously a lot different than an abandoned New Orleans, um, and even just reconnecting with people was really difficult for me. Um, it was something that left me emotionally and physically exhausted. Um, I really needed a month of just just to recover from it as I worked with, you know, and as soon as I got back, I was working with these images. So I was reliving those experiences, what I saw, what the stories I heard. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I gave a lecture a little while ago and I read a different story. Um, you know, I had to hold back tears, like in the middle of this lecture. Um, and it's that profound personal connection that, um, you know, it's, I, I have no control over it anymore. It's something that I'm, that I'm doing and uh, obsessed with. Um, and what, and exploring what, what, what will become of the future. Right. You no, know, I find it interesting <coughs> myself how sometimes putting a camera between you and what you look like sort of abstracts it and sometimes mm -hmm. it personalizes the experience where it's a content because, in a sense, intellectually, you know what you're really looking at and the trauma that other people have suffered as a result of that. And, uh, it, but it also brings, me, brings you closer. The, the yeah. camera is, is, for me, brings me closer. Um, it's, it's how I connect with my subject. It's how I feel. It's, it's you know, it, it's the every day that, you know, you can kind of become numb to things. But it's the camera that is, for me, an act of passion and love. And it's, it's the, the, the scene, the exploring, the that really connects me to my subject. Um, for me, you know, everyone's different. How is it for you, Larry? Looking at, looking at the, <clears throat> I went to Mississippi on the last day of my trip, and I missed my plane. Let so me leave it at that. Uh, 
Uh, well, there's a lot of, I guess, a lot of different feelings about it. Um, first is that I really love the city. I've been, I was there four times before uh, the flood, the hurricane, the flood. So, um, for me, being in that place, even seeing what's happened to it, there are still parts of what makes it such a great American city, such a unique American city. So having access to that in a way is like a um, antidote, right. you know, right. because um, it it also is traumatic, um, and I you know like well I struggled with it too you know, um, and m my friend who lives there um, is a good check for me because you know New Orleanians have um, and we saw it in some of the signs and some of the uh, comments that people made the places. Um, they have a sense of humor, you know. Um, they have a sense of the way they think people live. They have a lot of pride in their city. And so, at the same time, they have to live with it, you know. And I get to come back here. So, um, every time I talk to my friend, or to her friends, or her neighbors, or other people that we meet, Something else sort of gives me a new perspective, you know? So I'm highly conscious of being a visitor to this environment, you know, or trying to interpret it, or being an outsider, not being a New Orleanian. And um, for me, the challenge then, and Larry stated it as a sort of moral challenge, you know, in taking what kinds of images you take, and I do think it is a moral challenge, is what to do with these kinds of photographs. You know, they um, they have a lot of personal meaning for me, uh, but how they're displayed or how to talk about them was a challenge. So this is you know a first attempt. Um, so maybe a year from now, you know, we'll have an update on what's happening in New Orleans or something like that. But um, it's incredibly challenging, personally challenging subject matter. You're right. I can't imagine another question after those answers, so thank you.